Hello and welcome to Off Their Shelf Reviews. I'll always remember that fucking troll. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Cat's Eye, which released in 1985 from writer Stephen King and director Louis Teague. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story kind of follows a cat called General who has been psychically contacted by a child that looks like a really young Drew Barrymore. The little girl is being tormented at night by a troll that lives inside her skirting board and wants to suck the breath out of her as she sleeps. But as General makes his way across America to get to the little girl, he mingles in with other people's lives and we see a couple of scary tales before the final battle. You're my only chance. You're my only chance. So Stephen King kind of uh, built up a good working relationship with uh, Dino De Laurentiis ah. and had some success with Firestarter mm. uh, the year before this and, of course, with a young Drew Barrymore in that one as well. Yeah, yeah. And they were looking at adapting Stephen King's short story books, uh, Night Shift. Right, right, right. And so took from there The Ledge, Quitter's Inc. Yeah. And then they were going to take another story from there but decided... Because they were going to do this wraparound story, yeah, yeah. Stephen King actually wrote his own original story just for the film, ah, which nice. is The General. Yeah, and uh, and of course, I've I've been what I've heard is that Stephen King actually used this as well as a way to secure himself as a director for a future film funded by Dino De Laurentiis, which would eventually be Maximum, Maximum Overdrive. Overdrive. So nice. yes. <laughs> But this is a, a Stephen King movie, uh, but uh, it's also the director. He's kind of a bit of a veteran of monster movies. Oh, nice. He, create, he was the director for Alligator. Ah, oh, yeah. The 1980 Love horror movie. Love Absolutely it. great creature feature. But he was also the director of Stephen King's Cujo. Oh, nice, nice. And of course, this film would also open with a few references to Stephen <laughs> King's work, including Cujo and, of course, Christine. And yeah. even if you didn't recognize that iconic Plymouth Fury, yeah. the bloody bumper tells you, <laughs> I am Christine. Yeah. Like it's, it's definitely not Arnie driving it, but um, it it does, you know, it's, he always hinted that Christine was never truly defeated. He did, he did. It could just be driving itself. Just around. repaired itself. No, yeah. no, there was definitely somebody in there. I was like, is that you, Arnie? <laughs> Maybe the ghost of Arnie. Ghost of Arnie, yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember watching this when I was really, really young, and the the troll story, the general, the third story of the, uh, the anthology, I suppose, like, that stuck with me from, like, my childhood all the way up. You know, up to like at least about two or three months ago where I went out and I purchased the Cat's Eye DVD simply because I wanted to watch that troll fight sequence again. I'd completely <laughs> forgotten the rest of the movie. Um, so I purchased it for myself. And, you know, the thing is, as you've grown up, like a lot of people had said, oh, yeah, Ian, you've got to read Carrie. You've got to read The Shining. You've got to read Misery. And I, I, I didn't. I watched all of Stephen King's stuff. You know, I've never read... Like, I've only read The Mist, which I read in one of his short story books uh, before they made that into a film. But everything else I've watched on, on, on screen. And yeah, the beginning for this, you know, it's so cool. Just watching that cat run around and then all of a sudden you've got that fucking scary looking bloody St. Bernard come out of nowhere. You know, and chase him down, drool dripping from his lips. You know, like you said, it's a cool little reference where, you know, the Plymouth Fury just kind of appears. And as a Stephen King, as a Stephen King fan, you're like, oh, oh, ooh, you know. <laughs> I thought there might be a couple little more, like when he, because he then gets onto a truck, doesn't he? And then the truck takes him to uh, New York City, which I was hoping would have like a couple of little other references around. Well, there, there are other references in the film as we do catch up with James Woods. At one point, he's watching The Dead Zone on TV. Oh, is he? Which is the Christopher Walker movie. Yeah. That's a Stephen King story. And what does he do when he gets up? He says, who writes this crap? Who writes and this I was crap? like, you know what? He'd like Even back then... Stephen King enjoyed ripping on himself, yeah, because uh, he's done that all the way up until like the modern It yeah. movie. So it's yeah, it's fine. It's great. <laughs> but on top of that, there is also in the third story, the mum who hates the cat. Yeah, when she's in bed, she's reading Pet Cemetery. She is. She so, is reading Pet. There Cemetery. are a few other little ones. Maybe there's more, but yeah. those were the ones that really stood out. I was hoping for like a balloon to go past, or like the clown in the background, or something. Um, I, I, at the same time with James Woods, when he stops at a um, traffic light, I was hoping the big truck. 
<laughs> but then maximum overdrive hasn't been made yet. So, right. um, but yeah, we we follow James Woods first um, in the story Quitters Inc., which we we see uh, General get grabbed by this guy and taken into this building, and then we see James Woods sat in the car with his mate, and uh, James Woods plays Dick Morrison, who's looking to quit smoking. He's got a terrible habit, and he goes inside, and he's sat in the waiting room, and he's wanting to have a cigarette. And he's trying to sign these papers and there's a guy there who's just like crying into his hands. <laughs> he's just sobbing away and you know he's looking at him and he's like he's reading his thing and he's like you know what, actually i think uh they might want to leave yeah especially yeah. when the other guy's wife comes out and starts wailing on him <laughs> yeah, and the two of them end up out. shuffling out and he's like i'm gonna leave too but he gets called back in by dr vinnie donati played by alan king yeah who's just he's a total snake oil salesman isn't he and i thought, uh, I thought he was a bit of a mob boss well, absolutely you know, and like... he absolutely is just like that but he's just like you want it you got any cigarettes on you give them to me <laughs> he puts them all out on the table and he just starts hammering on them no, oh my god I'm like, okay so this is like extreme therapy to quit smoking but no it gets more bizarre than that when we find the cat from the earlier in the film is now in this this cage <laughs> with an electrified floor which he activates so the cat is bouncing up and down being shocked i was like that's Ooh. outrageous <laughs> and hilarious <laughs> And you, you, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. You, you find from Dr. Uh, uh, Donati as well, where he says to uh, James Ward's character, like, we're going to help you quit. You've signed up for this. We're so fucking 110% sure that we can make you quit that we are going to watch you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if we catch you once, once doing a slight, even you even look to smoking a cigarette, We'll put your wife in that room with the electrified floor. Yeah, not James Woods, but his wife. His wife. And that's on one offence. Yeah. What's the second offence? Well, second offence is that they they go for the wife and the daughter. No, just the, I think it's just oh, the it's daughter. Just the daughter, yeah. yeah. And then the third offence, the, I think, is both of them. No, the third offence is what caught me by very much surprise. Because yeah. this is a PG horror movie. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. actually kind of a family-approved Stephen King <laughs> anthology horror movie. But it's that third one that made me go double-take. Because he says... If you smoke a third cigarette, we're going to send this guy that we keep around here to come to your house and rape your, rape wife. your wife. And I was like, holy shit. I was like, <laughs> what? Like, what's stopping James Woods from just going out and calling the police? Right. But, you, you know, know, I guess he really wants to quit smoking. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I, mate, I was watching this and I was like, man, I want to quit smoking for him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the third offense. I'm afraid I have to send someone out to rape your wife. There's a rather disturbed individual we keep around here just for such distasteful jobs. And so James Woods goes home and he hasn't smoked since like three o'clock and he's getting ratty and pissed off. And it's James Woods. He's a great actor. He can he can, he can look stressed out really easily. You know, like this is this is post video drone. I think yeah, it is. So yeah. he's so he's gone off of that crazy shenanigans with David Cronenberg. You know, he hasn't worked with John Carpenter yet, but here he is with Stephen King. He's dropping drinks on himself. He's telling his wife he's given up smoking. And I, I, I really felt the heartfelt way where he says to her, like, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for our daughter. Who, which, funnily enough, his daughter Alicia is played by Drew Barrymore, who pretty much plays all the young children in this film, you know? Yeah. Um, and he goes to bed and he's trying to sleep. It's like really early morning and he gets up and he sneaks down to his office and he finds a cigarette in his, his drawer and he pulls it out and he's about to smoke it and he thinks he hears a, a noise his coming from his... His cabinet opens yeah, slightly. Yeah, from his cabinet. Yeah. So he goes in there and he whacks everything in there and doesn't doesn't notice anything. But then as he throws the umbrella behind his shoulder into it, he hits a guy. Yeah. And you realise there's somebody in the cabinet in the house. You see the well is there as well. Yeah. You're just like, doesn't water appear? I was like, because <laughs> it's raining outside. Oh, right, yes, yeah, so so he does come dripping. in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so James was like, look, I'm putting it back. I, I wasn't smoking. You can tell your boss I wasn't doing it. Ha, 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 ha. And he goes about his evening, goes goes back to bed. But then the next day, the doctor rings him up going, look, we know. You know, we were we were watching. And so you need to come down to the office because I need to, you know, have this little chat with you. <laughs> but everything is fine though you know everything is okay he's he's going clean he's not smoking he's yeah. fine until he's driving the car and he's stuck in traffic he's yeah. waiting for the boat to go past for the bridge to open and close he's got kids screaming in front of him yeah, yeah. and well he checks the glove box and what's in there 
but some cigarettes. Yeah. So he's like, "There's no one watching. I can sneakily have one. I can sneakily have one." <laughs> so the smoke so he's going up. And he's trying to blow <laughs> away, shot. and he looks up, and well, we see this goon just staring at him in the other car, yeah. just smiling like, "Oh, oh we yeah, know. man, I'm gonna <laughs> rape your wife. See ya." And he drives off. <laughs> And so we get to one of the most hilarious scenes in the film, <laughs> where the wife is now put in that electrocution chamber yeah. and is is frazzled. Whilst now, and this is the sick part: mm-hmm. is when they're playing music to, <laughs> to coincide with it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say this this episode or this this chapter of the film as well is a really good use of the is it the police song? Um, I'll be watching oh, I'll you. I'll be watching you. Yeah, yeah I yeah. mean, apparently it's not the official song because it was too expensive to get the rights to. Yeah, so yeah, they yeah. they got the rights to the, the the song itself and then got a cover band to play it that's in the movie. Nice. but it still fits it still so well, really well because yeah. you feel like. Yeah, he's being watched. He can't have a cigarette at all. Yeah. And now his wife is paid for it. And I love the fact that the two goons are just kind of like, oh, 10 bucks, yeah, she's going to slap him. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, but no, they hug and embrace and they go home and it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay because, it, like, weirdly enough, it, it like we don't know how long the time jump is because, you know, like... I think it was like three weeks or so. Well, that's, or more. Well, that's it. Gen- so General's in has been at this smoking place for three weeks before he manages to escape again. And so James Woods is there, and he's he's doing really well. And the doctor's just the doctor uh, Donati's just like, yeah, you've lost some weight. Here's some illegal diet pills. This should take your mind off the cigarettes. And you know, James Woods is like, ha ha. What are you gonna do if I don't take the pills? Come down and burn my house down. And he's like, no, we'll just chop off your wife's little pinky. And they're like, ha ha ha, laughing. <laughs> And so James Woods is at home uh, with his friend who uh, dropped him off at the start of the story to Quitter's Inc. And they're all, you know, enjoying a, a meal. And James Woods, Woods is just like, to Quitter's Inc. And the wife's like, to Quitter's Inc. And then his friend's like, to Quitter's Inc. And then the mate's wife is a bit reluctant to say it. And then she says, yeah, to Quitter's Inc. And he notices her finger has been chopped off. And you're like, oh, oh damn. Yeah. <laughs> they're really serious about that, they're too. They're really serious. <laughs> And that concludes um, Quitter's Inc.'s tale. But I just want to go back to the beginning of the film again, where the cat, the general, uh, you may may have mentioned it, did see uh, a mannequin in the store. Yeah, yeah. And it turned into a young Drew Barrymore who told the cat that it needed to go and save her. Yeah, yeah. It needs Um, to come across country and find her. Yeah. And so, obviously, we saw the cat then get captured and then it escaped. It kind of followed around this story before it ends up continuing on its trail before it eventually gets stuck in traffic in Vegas, what well, looks appears like, you know, a, yeah, a casino yeah. strip area. Um, but there was going to be like five minutes or so at the beginning of the movie, a prologue, yeah. which was cut by the studio uh, because they thought it was too silly. And it involved the cat trying to save a child from something before it was being shot at mm. by the parent after the child had died, thinking the cat had done it. Yeah. Um, and so it all just seemed a little bit odd. Uh, and then, so the film kind of starting the way it does, I think it still feels odd yeah. until you realise by the third tale, what, really, what the where the cat's trying to go. Especially when you keep seeing Drew Barrymore turn up in other little girl roles throughout yeah, the film. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I, like I said, I'd seen this a number of times throughout the, the years, but I swear when I'm sitting down to watch it for the review, I, I, I always thought that there was a section where General had gotten to the house, but the mum had kicked him out and then he had to make it and that's how he intertwined with these two tales right um and then at the same time i swear i i I could be thinking about a completely different film but i swear when james wood's wife went into the shock room that his daughter was put in there as well and the mum and daughter were in there so i'm probably (laughs) thinking of a completely different film but i was just when i was sat there watching the mum bounce i was like oh where's the daughter i swear the daughter's supposed to be coming in at this point um, but we, we follow Kenneth McMillan um, playing Kresner. Uh, Kenneth McMillan, you might recognise from fucking... Um, he's what was it, Baron Harkonian from fucking um, Dune, Dune, the old Dune. Um, he's also... I recently watched him as well in Runaway Train um, with John Voight. He's the train conductor who wants to throw, uh, derail the train. <laughs> wow. <It's> great. <laughs> um, and he's playing this kind of uh, rich mob boss, kind of just a kind of sleazy rich guy. Um, but he's talking to some guy that he uh, works for him and he's saying like, are you following my wife? Do you know where her boyfriend is? So you know something nefarious is up. 
and he's making bets with his mate about if General will make it across the road because General's in the middle of the road and there's just cars fucking shooting everywhere. Um, and so him, him, him and this guy, they make a, a couple of bets and General makes it across the road. And so Crescent's just like, yeah, yeah, I'll take you home with me because you made me some money. And, and when he gets home, he, uh, well, it cuts to his wife who is trying to escape with Robert Hayes um, playing Johnny Norris, you know, the tennis coach that she's been sleeping with. Right. And um, the wife gets on the bus and, and Johnny's just like, yeah, I'll get the money and I'll get our car and I'll hook up with you. You're safe. You're OK now. We're in love. And then two seconds later, he gets knocked out by two goons. Yeah. Did you recognize one of those goons? Uh, he's the guy who died of the heart attack in Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, but did you recognize the other goon? No, I did not. That was a very early role of Charles S. Dutton. Oh, <laughs> shit. Now, he's also the one who gets in the car and drives him to the hotel. Yeah, yeah. Charles S. Dunn didn't have a driver's license or knew how to drive at that point in time. So they actually had to give him a crash course in driving here. <laughs> and apparently it took several takes to get him to do that drive where he drives into park. But I was like, yeah, Fucking that's hell, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they, yeah, they drop uh, Robert Hayes off to Kresner and, you know, uh, Kresner's just like, yeah, I know that you've been sleeping with my wife and you've stolen my money and you're, you're this, that and next thing. I can either send you to the police because I've just stuck drugs in your car and you're going to go to jail and she's going to get arrested too. Or we can take a bet. And Kresner loves a good bet. And so he's got this ledge that goes around the top of his penthouse. And if Robert Hayes can make it around the ledge all the way around without dying, he gets the money and he gets to go free. Um, I yeah, I mean, I know it's it's old now. I know the film's old and so the, the, the visuals... Of the ledge, yeah, are dodgy as fuck. Oh, it, it's 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 actually quite hilarious. Yeah, now, I love a good miniature. I right. love yeah, good yeah. paintings. Yeah. But yeah, this film is looking very rough. Yeah, yeah, it in is. terms of its effects. But it's actually, I think, part of its charm as well, especially in some of the shots where you look at the the miniature. You see the miniature. You see the road and all the cars. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. yeah, it all looks to scale and fine. Uh, but if you look really closely, like now we have the benefit of high definition yeah yeah you can actually see that the cars aren't driving they're, no. not, they're not moving <laughs> no. as a matter of fact the road is moving because it's on a it's on a, a pulley system <laughs> it's literally or like pulling the cars along the road nice. so some of the cars all move at like the exact same speeds or stop in synchronization and actually towards the end of this chapter when the other guy's on the ledge if you look down there's actually a car going across the road sideways <laughs> <laughs> it's just like well so when you notice you're stuff not supposed like to that, look at that yeah you're not you're not but when you do you're just like it's kind of funny but then this entire chapter i found incredibly suspense filled and frightening really because of my fear of heights i thought that so when i was looking at it, i was like you're gonna be scared. yeah exactly and be considering like the i mean alan silvestri's score for this, this is like a year before he wrote the back to the future theme oh wow and really took off but i think his music in here is kind of a bit Synthy. I mean, I don't mind synth music, but it felt a bit synthy, but a bit hollow mm. compared to like Alan Silvestri's other orchestral scores. Yeah. And I think that was maybe what was lacking here. Yeah, it but doesn't I, imbue you with fear. Uh, not so much, but I did find that the music that he used for the ledge part yeah. really added to my my fear of heights and his fear of falling. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's just so when he is like loosely grabbing on or, or, or almost yeah. falling, yeah. or when the Bastard pigeon is pecking at his <laughs> ankles. Pigeon. <laughs> Bastard pigeon! Oh god, when he booted that pigeon, I was like, yes! God, I should have done the bloody same. I love the fact that it flies off and then it comes back. And it right. Like, I, 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 I don't mean any harm to animals, for real, okay? I, I've laughed quite a lot of animal harm in this review so far. I just want to <laughs> small print that right now. Uh, but again, there's another point that makes me laugh. When he finally gets all the way around and he's in that little alcove. Yeah, yeah. I was like, there's all these pots and plants there yeah. it's just like, how did anyone get there to water them uh, but then he fucking turns over the side with a <laughs> water hose <laughs> almost washes johnny right off the roof and he's like that was only half pressure keep going yeah. oh, god it's so tense when he's climbing over the sign and, and you just see it pulling oh, and tearing god, as yeah. it goes over i'm it's like on great. the edge of my Robert seat haze is, is, is great i mean he's the guy well, i know he can fly a plane i know he can fire a fucking plane <laughs> he's got a drinking problem right. Um, but he, he, he's got a lot more problems in this chapter. <laughs> he totally just sells that. And sometimes that can be the problem. We've said it before with, with movies like this is that sometimes there's a tale that kind of drags out. And I, I was kind of worried that you would 
you would find any of them boring and it would ruin the experience for you. But while I was watching this one, I was like, oh, this one should be pretty good because Gary doesn't do well with heights. No. You well, know, and this, they're really selling the fact that this guy could die at any point. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I liked that the first chapter, the Quitter's Inc., I was like, what What was the moral of the tale? Like, what was the fear? Mm. And obviously, you know, first thing is cigarettes and cigarettes killing people. Yeah. And then if you are a smoker, what's the thing you otherwise worry about the most? And that is harming those around you with your secondhand smoke and yeah. that's what Queer Zinc does with them harming those around uh, him yeah, should yeah. he smoke yeah. um, so I was like oh it's the fear of addiction it's the fear of death it's the fear of harming others I was like it's like a lot of little bits of fear work there and then in the second one I was like well this is just straight up a fear of heights <laughs> <laughs> and then well the third one is the fear of, fear of monsters under your bed so but I was it, like it didn't get too but, but deep well, with it well, but well, no, I, I mean, like that it played on different fears the, in each part. The second one also does have a really cool twist because Robert Hayes, uh, Johnny's character, does make it all the way round the ledge. And as he climbs in, uh, Kresner is setting up the bag full of money and his his bodyguard or whatever is going to walk in and kill Robert Hayes. So then as, as they're about to kill Robert Hayes, uh, he realizes that the girlfriend or the wife has been killed because her head's in a bag. You don't really see it, but you see just enough to know, oh, that's a bloodied head. Yeah. And Robert Hayes' expressions of whatever he's looking at, it's completely upset him. He manages to get hold of the silenced gun and shoots the bodyguard. And then instead of killing Kresner like he wants to, like he, you know, anybody in that situation would want to, he forces him out on the ledge. Awesome. And, and that's when I'm like... I don't have a fear of heights anymore. <laughs> I want to see this prick fall off the roof. And he does. That fucking pigeon that comes pigeon, back. Yeah, I'll take on the roof of that pigeon now. <laughs> I, I love that a little bit because, like, like I said, I thought the special effects had gotten a little bit old. But like I said, it goes with the charm of as, yeah. as that kind of I, silhouette uh, falls Yeah, that was off. the worst part. There's just It was all black silhouette. I was like, that's horrible. Oh, it, it, it is horrible, but like you had to have it fall, fall off. And then you have him kind of superimposed. That's fine. That down. was fine. That was... That was, like, usual. And I, I love the fact that we'd already had the horn set up earlier. Yes. So that it's fallen on the floor. And so then when he falls, and General you is don't watching see him it, for it. But you hear the horn. It. <laughs> it's great. That is great, yeah. Ah! And then the final story, yeah, it starts with uh, this thing in first person mode running up towards the house. It's kind of making some weird noises or whatever. And as... I'm going to bring up those weird noises. Oh, right, right yeah, I've, yeah, been, I've been dying yeah. to mention okay. it, but you, you know who did the voices uh, for it? No, I, I wrote it down, but I forgot. Did, did it sound familiar at all? It sounded like... Oh, it, it, it sounded like a car... It sounded like Slimer. It was Slimer! It, it was, was Slimer. Frank Welker! Yeah. Like, I was, the first thing it actually made me think of was Gremlins, and of course, that Frank Welker again. Yeah, so yeah. So I was like, yeah, and so all the little sounds, but yeah, most of all, it sounded like it our sounded friend like Slimer back right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was there. I, I, I was racking my brains as I was listening, and then all of a sudden, I could, all I could think of was Ghostbusters. Yes. And that's when it dawned on me. And um, this this thing is making its way into the house. And it, I mean, like I said, we, Quitters Inc. has been at least three weeks. God knows how long it's taken him to get from Atlanta, Atlantic City to where he is now. Um, and we it turns out that Drew Barrymore's character, the little girl, I suppose, because she hasn't really got a name, has been telling her parents for ages that there's something living in her skirt. You know, on a scramble, the edges of her room. But nobody's believed her. So time's all over the place in this one. But finally, General turns up and Drew Barrymore's trying to convince her mum to let him sleep in her room. But the mum is convinced by her mum that cats can suck the breath from children but it but it's terrified me as a fucking child because obviously i was a child of the 80s i must have seen this like late, late 80s early 90s and around about that time as well we had lots of baby cot deaths mm. you know where children were kind of just mysteriously dying in, in cots and you had to not lay them on their back you had to lay them on their side and don't give them too many blankets and stuff like that it was the motherfucking trolls, I'm telling you. When I had a son and the wife's like, we're getting a cat, I'm like, oh, fuck yeah. And it's sleeping in his room to stop these things from... Because it's... Oh, man, it's... I'm, I'm just jumping up because I've, I've been really excited <laughs> to fucking talk about the special effects right. for this troll. Because when, it, like, the, when the skirting board kind of opens up and he rips it open and you don't, you don't get a lot of focus on it, but the way whoever is, like... 
Is it Lewis Teague directing all three yes, stories? which is also strange for an anthology movie yeah, too. Yeah, because it's usually somebody different. So he really wanted to utilise, you know, the camera as the vision of the troll. So that when we see the troll, it's a guy in a suit. But you can't get a miniature guy in a suit superimposed next to a large bed. So you've kind of got, like... The, the guy in a suit standing in front of something trying to make himself look smaller or they no. made larger they, versions they were in the guinness book of records for this movie for creating the largest bed wow ever created for a set for a movie hell yeah because they made that bedroom massive they filled the warehouse to make yes. that bedroom and then they hired a little person to go in the suit so the scale then is increased even more yeah so it's actually fantastic this set it really is sold the only issue is is when they have to superimpose in drew barrymore yeah with with the the shot of the troll and yeah. also the cat yeah some so it's almost like three composited images yeah. at once and you can tell. Yeah. Uh, but I can it doesn't tell. take away from how brilliant that set is. Yeah. And also how brilliant that costume is. Uh, and it was designed by Carlo Rambaldi, who just the year before had designed E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Wow. So it's no wonder that's... that this thing looks so cool. Well, that's it as well. I mean, it, does, it, it doesn't look like it's got thousands of pounds or thousands of dollars thrown at it. But the, just enough of the way The articulation grimaces, of the mouth and the, the teeth. Eyes, yeah. you know. It's like the a... little bells as well, <laughs> yeah. the costume, the little dagger the he's little got. The little dagger, he's like... Yeah. yeah. He's, he's got a lot of little personality. And of course, with Frank Welker's noises coming yeah. out of it, it, you believe it. <laughs> the tail's oh, tail right at the end and it's... It's not very long either, but it's the one that always stuck with me as a kid. And so, like, you get this first little battle where it kills it kills the bird that is in uh, Drew Barrymore's uh, bedroom, and then it get, and that gets blamed on the cat when the cat tries to come in and tries to stop the monster. And so the mum is obviously convinced that the cat killed the bird, and so she takes it to a um, like a, um, a a cat's home or whatever, and it's going to be put down and it's going to be destroyed. You know, cause she doesn't want it in the house. That completely upsets Drew Barrymore because she's been telling her parents for fucking ages now that um, there's this creature um, trying to kill her in her sleep. And I was saying to Gary about this before we turned the camera on. What made it more, really got me was the fact that we'd seen Drew Barrymore kind of trying to talk to the cat throughout the movie in different cities. So she must be able to shine. You know, communicate long way because she even talks to the cat when it comes to her. So the cat must be talking back to her for her to know its name. Maybe. Yeah. I, know, I know it's a long shot, but I've watched a lot of Stephen King stuff, and all I get is, hey, all the universes are connected. So all of this shit must be connected somehow. And on top of that, when we do see the creature try to suck the life out of Drew Barrymore as she's sleeping. I reckon that's her shine. Right. That it's it's trying to eat her shine because that's how she communicates. But it's it's so great. I mean, night time comes, she has to go to bed. The creature comes out. It forces a door stop underneath the door so that the parents come in. This thing is fucking smart. Yeah, it knows it's in for the kill this night now. Yeah, and it, it clambers up on the bed. It pulls the quilt down, you know, and it just starts. It, it was it? It holds her nose. Yeah. You see the thing hold her nose, and then her mouth opens, and it's breathing in, and so she starts coughing. But the general's escaped from the cat's yeah. home. Yeah, climbs up the tree, in through the window... And then that's where I mentioned where you have that three-way composited image on the screen. Uh, but this se this sequence is amazing. Like I, I know they went through several cats. So they, didn't, they didn't like die or anything. Right, they just right. used several cats in order to get the shots uh, yeah. because they were using treats to get the cats to do what they wanted. But once the cats were fed enough, they, they, were like, they wouldn't play no more. Yeah, so yeah. next hungry cat in to do the shot. Um, but yeah, like watching it chase him around the house. and I almost felt sorry for the little demon at one point where he, he's just like, oh, get away from me. <laughs> So it's fun. cat and mouse, right? It's the way it gets the balloon and then the yeah, balloon starts, starts to go down. 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 <laughs> yeah. And it's all it's all of Frank Welker's noises. But eventually he ends up getting on the record player. 
<laughs> yeah. He's playing the song from the first chapter. And, uh, and Drew's just like, faster, kitty, faster. faster yeah. And the cat's knocking it and knocking up the speed so it's spinning around. The parents are screaming at the door to get let in. And eventually it hits the thing and it goes flying off right <laughs> in through the fan and explodes. We don't uh, see the bloody explosion, but by God, do we uh, see the remains? Yeah. <laughs> And that also convinces the parents, like, oh shit, maybe, maybe, maybe our kid wasn't lying. Yeah, because he's got a little arm there. Yeah. There's a fucking arm with fingers. You're like, oh, oh fuck, shit. That's, that's, that's real. Yeah. All right, we're going to metal up all the skirting boards now. Uh, she and... pulls away that book, doesn't she? She's like, look, look at the hole. Yeah. It's like that's not a mouse hole, motherfucker. So. Then she's allowed to keep the cat. Yeah. And the very next night, the cat comes in. And I was like, oh, this is where the film gets dark. This <laughs> yeah. is where the cat sits on her chest and swallows her soul. But no, the, the cat just licks cat, her. And it's yeah. like, oh, it's, it's got its fish. It's got its home now. All's well that ends well. Yeah. Hey, good ending, Stephen King. Holy shit. Holy shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, here were your favourite parts of Cat's Eye. Oh, man. I mean, like I said, I, I've always kind of had a soft spot for this movie. I mean, I went out and put on DVD after fucking 20 years. And so for me, I, it's, I, I'm just going to be easy. Um, it's the, oh, the whole troll sequence. I love that sequence from start to finish. And like part of me wishes it was longer, but that's the novelty of it. It's so short that I just remember those bits. The special effect of the guy in the suit is great. Yeah, the special effects of the superimposing is dated now, but at the same time, that's its charm. You know, I remember rem looking at it as a kid and fucking totally believing it for the next 40 fucking years of my life. That you there still was believe it. I still <laughs> believe it, man. Don't, if I ever see a baby Sorry. in a room, I'm like, have you got a cat? Yes, good. Okay, because trolls, mate. Trolls. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have any, like, out outrageously memorable <laughs> moments uh, in the film. Yeah, not not really memorable moments, but some some. I, I really enjoy James Woods. Yes, uh, in James this film. Woods like, is fun. I don't know what it is about him, but I always find him fascinating to watch on screen. He's got so much energy. Yeah, uh, and uh, he's he's almost Nicolas Cage. You know, like not not to that extreme. Oh yeah, yeah, is Nicolas Cage almost James Woods though? That's right. Mm. But I also yeah, you know, there's if if you like watching cats. There is tons of cat footage in this film. Yes, uh, cats on bridges, cats yeah. on on in cars, cats eating. Just cat, cats, cats ev doing everything in cat, this film. The, cats like, the cat ass. is the real hero. Yeah, it kicks ass. Uh, and so yeah, I also really quite, quite like the photography and uh, yeah, some some memorable parts there. Of course, watching uh, the cat in the electrical chamber, then the wife in the electrical chamber, <laughs> and then that bastard pigeon. <laughs> in. Yeah. You recommend Cat's Eye? I do recommend Cat's Eye. I mean, it's just a fun little movie, short story anthology, and they're always really cool because you just get lots of little different mixtures of stuff. You know, like we've said it before, Grim Prairie Tales and Necronomicon and, and Tales from the Crypt and fucking uh, Creep Show, Creep Show and Twilight Zone. They're all they're all fucking great. And but for me, Cat's Eye always just took the top because it's Stephen King and that. Fucking troll. <laughs> yeah, I'm also going to be recommending Cat's Eye. It's a really fun, darkly comedic anthology film with plenty of suspense, thrills and surprises that deliver the horror without the need for buckets of blood. Lewis Teague, a veteran of monster movies alongside Stephen King, created a memorable collection of stories and adapted them well, with each segment feeling fresh and different, yet well-connected compared to the usual anthology horror you know, wraparound story structure. The cast were all great. James Woods is always entertaining to watch and young Drew Barrymore clearly shines here, you know, right near the start of her career. The music by Alan Silvestri is very 80s sounding. Lots of synth sounds, a little cheesy with some pop sounding moments, but it feels a little hollow when compared to his later work. Still, the Cat's Eye song and score complement the film's wicked, yet playful, mischievous nature. The effects all look dated now, with clear miniatures and matte paintings and bad compositing, but it still works in the film's favour. It's part of the charm. And the giant kid's bedroom set has to be seen. It's really well done there. So yeah, this one's worth a watch. It's fun, a little silly, it has a good pace with interesting stories dealing with different fears, where the real star is a cat, the general. Follow the newest cat and creature game as played through. 
thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews.